I'll be reading Luke chapter 2, verse 1 to 20, from the New International Version. The birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Cyrenus was governor of Syria, and everyone went down to and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judah, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the, with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told what had been told what had been told them about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them but mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart the shepherds returned glorifying and praising god for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told All right, well, we'll be looking at the uh, Luke 2 Christmas story, and uh, <clears throat> again, as we prepare to look at one of the most intriguing stories in all history, again, I just want to say a special welcome to everyone here, and if you're a guest today, uh, thank you for coming. If you're uh, one of those family members that comes home to Brandon for Christmas, welcome here, and a uh, special welcome to uh, a couple, I don't know, I, they've never been in church when I preach, but they're apparently they're from Mesa. And uh, <clears> the <throat> last name is Pierce or something like that. They're one of each Canadians that have come home. Thank you for giving us your home. We really enjoy that. And uh, uh, yes. Uh, I forgot to mention to you, I dropped something off at Gordon's this morning, and he said to say hello to the church, and he had walked up and down this border five times. All right. So Orton Anderson is doing well after his his surgery. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> little girl was sitting on her grandpa's lap and uh, rattling off a long list of her uh, Christmas list, of her wish list. And the grandpa thought this was a teachable moment. And so he said, honey, it is more blessed to give than to receive. To which the granddaughter replied, I know that, grandpa, but receiving is good enough for me. Um, what are you hoping to receive this Christmas time? American Express did a survey that found that 31% of people said that receiving a fruit cake would be worst gift of all. Can you imagine? They would rather receive nothing than get fruit cake. Well, I'm the opposite. I love fruit cake. So if you have any leftover fruit cake in January, you just my office is right over there. <clears throat> what do you do with gifts that you didn't want? Well, the survey says that 30% to store it in their closet, 21% return it, and 19% end up giving it just to someone else. The unfortunate thing is the greatest gift ever given is hardly ever received in this world anymore. The majority of people do not want to receive the best gift of all, the gift of Jesus. 
It's such an intriguing story, and uh, I call it the intrigue of Christmas for a reason, because I find all the characters, all the details in this story very intriguing. Um, for example, I look at this, the intrigue of history, the setting in which the Christmas story came. To think that of all seasons, Christmas came at tax time. So apparently, about every 14 years, the entire Roman Empire, everybody had to register so they could, you know, Rome could know who can all pay taxes. And uh, all peoples that were conquered by the Romans had to pay four times as much tax than if you were a Roman. So if you were a conquered people, and the Jews were a conquered people, they had to pay four times as much tax as a Roman would to keep the Roman Empire going. And so when this registration took place, the Jews were not happy campers. I mean, who's happy at tax time unless you get a, re, you know, a return? Well, there's no returns here. Everybody has to give and register to give to Rome. So the Jews would have been murmuring. This was not a happy time. And yet the Bible says when the time was just right, at the right time, at the right place, Jesus came. And so someone has said that uh, if you really want to celebrate the true spirit of Christmas, it should be done in April during tax season. That's when Christmas actually came, when people were getting ready to be taxed and to register to be taxed. <clears throat> I just find it intriguing that this is one of those stories that it's not once upon a time in a faraway country. This is not, this story doesn't come alongside myths and legends. This is history in the making. In those days, Caesar Augustus. This is history at work. And the Lord is the Lord of history. And he used this historical time to create history in a whole new way of all things during tax season. There's another thing I find very intriguing in the characters of this Christmas story, and of course, it would be Mary. And we both, Joseph and Mary, but I just want to zero in on Mary just for a minute. I'm going to leave Joseph out of it for the moment. We know according to Luke chapter 1, that Mary spent the first three months of her pregnancy with Elizabeth. She wasn't even in Nazareth. She wasn't even home the first three months that she was pregnant. Then she came back, and I'm sure that pretty soon uh, news started to go throughout the community. We know that it was basically a very small community, maybe a town of about 100 people back then. But we know from rabbinic writings that Mary was a disgrace in Nazareth. It was not a good place to be. When you are carrying a child, and that happened before you were married. And then to give the kind of story that they had to give to their community, which was, I'm sure, not believed by hardly anyone. I'm sure she could hardly wait to get out of town. And so for Mary to take this three-day journey from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. And as you're on your this journey, all the other different Jews who were of that line of David that had to go to Bethlehem to register, so Mary and Joseph wouldn't have been the only ones. So you are on this trek on your way to Bethlehem, and other people come alongside and say, hi, who are you? And, oh, oh, okay, how long have you been married? And How long? Oh, and you can see, whoa, we've got a different story here. And no matter where Mary would go, no one would understand her. No one would believe her. 
and just how alone Mary must have felt in her excitement, in her secret from God, who this child was, and why things were the way they were. I had an associate pastor, uh, Dwayne Berry. I remember him preaching on the life of Mary for a Christmas sermon. And he entitled his message, Have a Messy Christmas. And I've never forgotten that. I go, yeah, that would have been a messy Christmas for Mary. And yet, a Christmas from God. And to think the details surrounding the giving of the birth. In that culture, you always had a midwife in a Jewish home when a baby was born. As this part of your culture, you had a midwife. And yet it says when Mary gave birth, she wrapped the baby. She laid him in a manger. And there's something about Mary that makes her look alone. There's no midwife. There's no mom. Where are the aunts that could maybe help out? But this was, it was Mary, it was Mary, it was Mary. And I just, in a sense, feel how alone this must have been to be involved in something that had never happened to you before. No relatives, no bedroom, or no living room, no support, no one there, just Mary. I find that very intriguing, her aloneness in this story. And yet, of course, the Heavenly Father was with her. But humanly speaking, I find it very intriguing how alone she is in this story. And then the intrigue of Bethlehem. Bethlehem was not known for any historical earth-shattering event. When you think of Bethlehem, what do you think of? Well, close to Bethlehem, Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel, was buried there. That was actually just outside of town. And of course, she gave birth to Joseph. And then she died as she's giving birth to her second son. And as she was giving birth, she named him Ben Onai, son of my sorrows. And of course, Jacob didn't like that. He didn't want to have a son called Dr son of sorrows, so he quickly named him son of my right hand. And to think that Jesus came from a line where he was man of sorrows and yet at the right hand of the Father. But to be born at Bethlehem, the thing that Bethlehem is known for is it was known as the town of David. What does that mean? Well, David was born at Bethlehem. He was raised at Bethlehem. He was anointed king by Samuel at Bethlehem. So it is known as the town of David. And since he is of the line of David, as the adopted son of Joseph, who's of the line of David, and so it's fitting that he be born at Bethlehem so he could be of the line of David and be on his throne. Then there is the intrigue of the shepherds. If you were a modern day public relations agent, you would definitely not choose shepherds to announce the greatest news to the world. If you want to target movers and shakers, you're not going to choose shepherds. Especially in that day, you might have chosen the high priest and said, look, there's a very, you are the religious head. There is a very important announcement to be made. We're telling you what the announcement is. Now you, because you are head of the church, 
you're the religious leader, you need to make this announcement. But it wasn't the high priest. It wasn't the chief priests and scribes, the leading teachers in Israel. It wasn't the Sanhedrin, the body of 70 elders that sort of were the theocratic leadership of Israel. And it wasn't the Pharisees who were the religious fundamentalists who were strict about Old Testament prophecies and were awaiting the Messiah's arrival. I mean, there's various people groups you could have chosen to tell Israel and the world the Messiah has come. But those were not God's options. He chose shepherds. Now in history, past to be a shepherd was to be a good thing. A lot of key religious figures in the past were shepherds. But by the time we get to Jesus' time, their reputation had greatly diminished to the point where they were pretty well at the bottom end of the social strata next to the lepers. Their responsibility was to be with dirty animals seven days a week. That meant they were Sabbath breakers. They were always with dirty animals, which meant they were not ceremonially clean and could never enter the temple area. They were illiterate, so their word could never be used in a court of law. And yet, God chose the shepherds to announce to the world the coming of Messiah. And then in verse 15, it says, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, There's an ongoing discussion. Wow! This is so out of this mainstream, so out of this world. And they're discussing among themselves, what do we do with this great news? Do we go, what do we do with this? We're never welcome anywhere. And suddenly we are welcomed to the heart of history. And they're discussing this, what do we do? And of course, their great response then is, to go. Now what I find interesting, in verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the, who told them? What does it say in the Bible? Who told them what had happened? The angels? It says what the Lord. I find that interesting. And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us. To them, this wasn't just shepherds. They had been visited by the Lord, and the Lord had, this came from the Lord himself. This was exciting stuff. The Lord has given us this good news. Wow. Let's go and see this thing that has happened. I've always been bothered by that word, think. Let's go see this thing that has happened. So I look to see what that word is. It's actually the Greek word rhema, which means an utterance, a revelation, a word. Let's go see this revelation that has been given to us. They marveled at the announcement that had been given to them. And the Bible says that they hurried off, or as the old King James says, they made haste. This was from the Lord. They had received a rhema, a statement, a revelation. Something special has happened. And they, as shepherds, had the privilege to check it out and tell the world what had taken place. Then to see their obedience, they hurried off and found. And that word found means to search diligently. They had to search till they found this baby. What was all involved in this searching? We don't know. But they had to search for this baby. Then, of course, upon seeing Jesus, they spread the word about him. 
So much so, they had a, just a, a profound influence on the public. Look at verse 18. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. People impacted by the words of shepherds? That had never happened before. They've been impacted by the teachings of the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees. And now they are impacted by the shepherds. I know oh, the profound impact it had on Mary. It says, but Mary treasured up all these things. There again is that word things, and it's the same word rhema. She pondered about all the rhema, the statements. The shepherds would have told her that they had heard from the Lord through the angels. And Mary's just, whoa. Mary's just awestruck at what's happening. There's the intrigue of the angels. This news is so important. It took a heavenly visitor to tell the world what had happened, what had taken place. No earthly announcement would have been good enough. This announcement had to come from the heavens through the heavens. God needed angels, servants from above to break through into the realm of the cosmos and tell this world what had happened. Not the high priest, chief priest, leading Pharisees. No. Shepherds. I mean angels. What I find interesting is that once the angel had made the announcement, of course then there's a whole myriad of angels appearing in the sky, singing glory to God in the highest. Because shepherds were ceremonially unclean and could not go into a temple to worship, they weren't privileged to go in and hear temple choirs or anything like that. And suddenly, this heavenly worship team shows up. They heard the best music you could have ever heard. Those temple choirs would be nothing compared to this worship team that appeared in the sky. And there, of all concerts, was this awesome Christmas concert, this announcement, praising and glorifying God in the heavens as they announced the good news. And I love the announcement. The angels said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news. He did not say, I bring you good advice. Timothy Keller, in his book, Hidden Christmas, writes this. Advice is counsel about what you must do. News is a report about what has already been done. <clears throat> advice urges you to make something happen. News urges us to recognize something has already happened. Advice says it's all up to you to act. News says someone else has acted. I like that. We are pronouncing good news. Someone has acted. Someone has come. There is no, well, what's the moral to the story? The whole story, every word is divine truth and a revelation of God working in history and working in our hearts. Then I find intrigue in Mary's response. Verse 19. Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The word pondered means to put into context, 
to connect, to think something out. It's just like looking at a verse in the Bible and asking, what does this mean? How does this fit with all the other things I know to be true? How does this fit with the rest of the Bible? In Psalm 119, verse 130, we read, the unfolding of your words give light and give understanding to the simple. I love the metaphor of unfolding. When you're on a hike, and you got this little rain jacket all you know, packed, balled up, and you just stuff into your backpack, and you're walking, and suddenly it starts to rain. And you reach back, and you pull out this little ball, and you unfold it, and suddenly that little ball is this nice big jacket that fits over you and covers you from the rain. I love this imagery of the unfolding. And Mary pondered all that. She, she was unpacking, she was unfolding all these statements, all this rhema, all this revelation, all this truth. And she's going, hmm, okay, yeah. There's these verses in the Old Testament. And then there's something that Elizabeth said. And then there's something Joseph told me that the angel has said. And then there's something that the angels have said to their shepherds. And, and then there's what the angel told me. And she's just unpacking it all. And she's just pondering and just unfolding. And as it all begins to be part of a big picture, I just love this intrigue of Mary. It's all making sense. I start to see the big picture and I'm getting excited. Pondering all these uttered expressions, this rhema that the angel had said. Then there is the intrigue of our Lord's names and titles and well, we could spend Sundays on that. Unto you is born this day in the town of David a Savior. Now, the pagan world had a pretty good idea of a Savior. The Greek word Savior was Zoter, and that was a very popular word. In fact, Caesar Augustus, the one who issued this decree for all the conquered worlds of Rome to be registered for taxation. What was his title? The Savior of the world. That's what Caesar Augustus called himself, the Savior of the world. You see, the title Savior was given to many people. Philosophers who delivered people from ignorance were called saviors, intellectual saviors. Doctors who delivered people from death were called saviors from death. Great political leaders who delivered their people from their enemies were called saviors. But when Jesus came along, he was a different savior. He shall save his people not from ignorance, not from their enemies, but he shall save their people, his people from their sins. Unto you, unto each one of us, is born this Savior, this Deliverer. And of course we're told that he is Christ the Lord. And the word Christ means a special figure who would appear to execute God's plan for the world. There's a one set aside, anointed by God, a special figure who will do something that this world needs because of its need. And that person is Jesus. He will be the anointed one, the Christ. The one set aside and blessed by the Father to come and deliver us from all our needs. He will be the Christ. And then, of course, he's also called the Lord. Now, in our English language, we have used Lord in the past, especially if you're from England. 
And the term Lord would refer to a higher class of people, Lord Mountbatten, or you had Lady Di. I remember in Medicine Hat, the mayor is sometimes referred to as his lordship. Now, when that word Lord is used of people, it is always with a small L. Never with a capital L, because now you're in a whole different league. But for a human being to refer to as an exalted, to have an exalted title, your lordship, a small L, that, that's one thing. Now, when it was changed to a capital L, now it has a whole different designation. When the Greeks translated the Old Testament Hebrew into the Greek language, every time they came to the name Yahweh, instead of writing Yahweh or Jehovah, they wrote Lord with a capital L. 6,156 times God is referred to as Lord. Over 6,000 times. I did a study of Luke chapter 1. Because you're going to find consistency. If Luke is going to call him Lord, has Luke used that term before? Yes. In fact, in chapter 1 alone, Luke records God being referred to as Lord 17 times. And the Lord God said. Now, when the announcement is made, he is the Lord, what's Luke telling us? Jesus is God. He is deity. That word Lord with a capital L is used in the same format as referring to God himself in chapter 1. This story simply continues, and when Jesus is introduced, he is introduced as our God. God made manifest in the flesh. Well, very quickly, our application. What are the practical effects of this Christmas story? I find three applications. There's many more, but I'll narrow it down to three. Number one, Jesus has no equal. Jesus has no equal. When we turn to him, there is no one greater, there is no one higher. The discouraging thing about being a human being is when you think you're really hot stuff, pretty soon someone else comes along and is hotter. When someone has this huge accomplishment in sports, how many of you remember, now I'm dating myself, how many of you when Bobby Hull scored goal number 50? Everybody's going, Bobby who? Well, when the Golden Jet, Bobby Hull, scored the 50th goal, we thought, oh my goodness, we have a Superman on the ice. 50 goals in one season. Will that record ever be broken? Well, now there's all kinds of people scoring more than 50 goals. Someone will come along and somehow they'll be bigger, faster, stronger, smarter. Goals are always broken. Trophies are always replaced by new trophies. Not with Jesus. There is no equal to Jesus. He has never been and never will be outranked, overthrown, or undermined. His reign is secure. His authority is sure. No one will suddenly appear to be greater in power. He is Lord. He knows no limitations, experiences no frustrations, and faces no threats. He salutes no one. All salute him. He bows to no one. All bow to him. Jesus has no equal. He's Lord. Secondly, 
Joy is central to our message. When the angel said, I bring you good news of great joy, and as I was pondering them, I underlined it in my verse. Joy. Why joy? Joy, more than anything else, clearly and unmistakably reveals the work, the value, the splendor of God. I have a a definition here by Dr. Samuel Storms on joy, which I really like. He wrote, quote, Joy is the deep, durable delight in the splendor and all-sufficiency of God and what he has for us in Jesus. I love that deep, durable delight. I just sort of, I just kind of hang on to that. Go, yeah, that's it, that deep, durable delight. It's not just your surface little, you know, I'm happy today. But it, it's that something deep down inside that even when times are tough, there is that deep appreciation, gratitude that My God can supply all my needs, even in my darkest valleys. Even then, I can have the joy of being in awe of him. When Jesus is the treasure of my life, I can have that durable joy there, even in hard times. Now the question is, why do we do doctrine? Why do we give knowledge? Why do we try to impart understanding? Why all this teaching and preaching and reading kind of stuff? The answer is to awaken joy in the splendor and the all-sufficiency of God in Christ. God has all this in store for you. So I'm reading this so I can delight in him. I can rejoice in him. So the joy of the Lord is my strength. Or as Peter said in 1 Peter 1.8, Though you have not seen him, yet you love him. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible, glorious joy. Joy is a a very unique phenomenon of the human heart. It only comes when you are completely engaged in knowing and enjoying God. I can tell myself to will something and do it without joy. For example, I can will myself to eat olives. I don't like olives. Please don't bring me an olive pizza. If I have to, I will eat it. I will will myself to eat olives, but I can't engage olives with joy. The only joy I would have is pretty soon I'm done with it. (laughs) I can go on with life. Because joy engages all of you. And there's no such thing as insincere joy. You can fake having joy, but you can't have fake joy. Joy is that pure, pristine, whole response to God. In his awe in his all-sufficiency in Christ. That's why we say, joy to the world, the Lord has come. In your darkest moment, you can have that deep, durable delight in who God is through Christ. Then the third, response. The Christmas story must become my story. It has become my story, my story. A Savior has been born to you. I love Corey Ten Boom's in- <clears throat> insight. <clears throat> Here's what she writes, quote, If Jesus were born a thousand times in Bethlehem, but not in me, I would still be lost. I'd still be lost. He has to be born in me. Not just born out there. He has to be born in my heart. I have to have a new beginning with Jesus in me. 
where Stephen Lawson wrote, quote, salvation is not a reward for the righteous, but a gift for the guilty. A gift for the guilty. A savior has been born to you, each one of us. Have I received that forgiveness? And so in our response to Christmas this year, May something about the intrigue of history in the making, the unfolding, grip your heart. And may the effectual truth somehow shape how you do Christmas this year. I, I end with this illustration. Back in 2007, the Washington Post related this story. Quote, and I'm reading from the Washington Post. He emerged from the metro at the plaza station and positioned himself against a wall beside a trash basket. By most measures, he was nondescript. A youngish white man in jeans, long sleeve t-shirt, baseball cap. From a small case, he removed a violin. Placing the open case at his feet, he shrewdly threw in a few dollars in pocket change as seed money, swiveled to face the pedestrian traffic, and began to play. It was 7.51 a.m. on a Friday. For the next 45 minutes, the violinist performed six, six great classical pieces. During that time, somebody must have been standing and counting, during that time, 1,097 people passed by. No one knew that the violinist was Joshua Bell, one of the world's leading classical musicians who fills concert halls. On this Friday, Bell played as on one of the most valuable violins ever made, a Stradivarius valued at $3.5 million. The train station provided good acoustics for his performance, and his beautiful music filled the morning air. Over the time that he played, seven people stopped to listen for at least one minute. While passing by, 27 people gave money. Just to give a, give a frame of reference, Bell was accustomed to getting paid about $1,000 per minute in his concerts. This day, in total, he received $32.17. At the end of each piece, there was no applause, just silent indifference. The master musician was ignored. People walked past musical glory without giving it a second glance, with the exception of two people. The first was a postal worker named John who had learned his violin as a youth and instantly recognized the quality of the performance. The other person was a woman named Stacy. Stacy had seen Josh Bell in concert three weeks earlier and recognized him. But she had no idea what was going on, but stayed until the concert was over. Later, Stacy told the reporter, quote, it was the most astonishing thing I've seen in Washington. Joshua Bell was standing there playing in rush hour, and people were not stopping, not even looking. And some were just flipping quarters at him. Quarters! I was thinking, what kind of a city do I live in that this could happen? The King of Glory came to this world. And our world won't even give him a corner. The bulk of the world ignores him, don't even want to hear his name. But it may be said of each one of us that we will stop and pay homage and invite him in and, pray and play the greatest songs of salvation in my heart even today. Let's bow in prayer together. Lord Jesus, 
as you left heaven's glory and you came to walk on this earth. Not recognized. Not accepted by the world, let alone your own people. But you came to make yourself real. And there are those who do respond and say yes. And thank you for those here today who've recognized how special you are, who you are. And they've said, yes, Lord, yes. I want you to be Lord of my life. To be born in my heart. So, Lord, this Christmas season, Thank you that as gathered believers, here we are gathered to pay homage to the King of kings and the Lord of all lords, the Savior Christ the Lord. Father, should there be anyone here today that, who are on that journey of believing but haven't totally stepped over and said yes to making Jesus their Savior and Lord, that even now in their mind, in their heart, in their spirit, as I pray, they would pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you that you came to be born at Bethlehem. But you came to be born in my heart. And I need you. And I confess my sins to you. And I ask you to be my Savior. Forgive me of all my sins. Thank you that when you came, you came to go to the cross and die my death. Pay the price for my sins. And I could have a fresh start with God and become his child. And I receive you as my Savior, my Christ, my Lord. I declare you to be the Lord, the God of my life. Come into my heart. Take control of the throne of my heart. And Jesus, make me the kind of person you want me to be. I thank you for hearing my prayer. And I hereby declare myself to be a follower of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank you that you love me. And this morning, I can say, Jesus, I love you. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for coming into my life. Help me like the shepherds to go out and share with others the good news of what it's like to know Jesus as Savior and Lord of our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name.